Shalom and welcome to the first lecture in the Ghetto Fighters House new international online series, Talking Memory. My name is Medine Shachar and I work at the Ghetto Fighters House as a guide and educator. Tonight, we have hundreds of participants from all over the world. You are already chatting, which is wonderful to see. Some are scholars and Holocaust researchers. Some are directors of Holocaust and other Jewish institutions. Many are students on their way to a master's degree or PhD. We have partners and friends who support the Ghetto Fighters House and others who just want to learn. Most importantly, we have a number of Holocaust survivors and second generation sons and daughters in our audience tonight. It is in their honor that we are talking memory. And just to mention that today is August 2nd and this day marks two historical events that are relevant to our subject. First, the 77th anniversary of the uprising in Treblinka in 1943 and the 76th anniversary marking when the Nazis murdered the remaining Roma men, women and children in the gypsy camp at Auschwitz-Birkenau in 1944. And just some housekeeping before we start, our lecture is being recorded and will be available via YouTube on our website and on our Facebook page, Ghetto Fighters House. And uh, please share with your friends that weren't able to be with us today. Um, we have put all participants, as you can see, on mute in order to avoid unwanted noise during the lecture. But as you can see, you have the chat box and you can send questions throughout the lecture. And I will present as many as possible at the end of Professor Grabowski's talk. And before I introduce our guest speaker, I would like to give the microphone, the screen to Igal Cohen, the CEO of the Ghetto Fighters House, who will say a few words, and then to Professor Hanna Yablonka, the Ghetto Fighters House History Advisor. So Igal, we're starting with you. Shalom and welcome to the Ghetto Fighters House International Online Lecture Series, Talking Memory supported by Daphne Foundation. My name is Igor Cohen, and I'm the CEO of the Ghetto Fighters House. I'm honored and happy to welcome all of you from over 25 different countries around the world. We have created a fascinating program, and I'm sure you will find it interesting and relevant. As the pandemic continues to keep the museum closed, we open the Ghetto Fighters House to the world and would we'll love to see you with us in our next lectures. I would like to thank Medin for leading this new project and Professor Hanna Ablonka for his support. A special thanks to you, Professor Jan Grabowski, for opening our special international series. I wish all of our guests a meaningful and interesting lecture. Thank you. Um, hello, uh, I am the historian of the Ghetto Fighters Museum for over 20 years. And uh, I wish you all good morning, good evening, good afternoon, <laughs> wherever you are. These indeed are unprecedented times, challenging, all of which was considered only a few months ago, normal and mundane. Um, in Israel, some of the people compare it. I don't know why, it's arguable, but compare it to their feelings during the Holocaust. Culture, however, is one of the most he uh, struck uh, fields uh, from the pandemic. But we inspired by our forefathers who were fighters and survivors. We are looking all the time for new venues of fighting the hardships and survive the closure, survive the distancing and survive the low volume of direct human touch, which we all suffer from so much. Tonight is one such effort to get in touch with our loved friends all over. <clears throat> Jan Grabowski was so kind as to enable us the effort with the very best as a beginning. <laughs> um, we wish, we really wish to contain some dialogue with you and we wish you could share with us your wishes for further dialogue with all of you with us here with the hope of reaching soon the day after, which I usually refer to, to the year 1945, but now I refer to the unknown future. 
I wish you all a joyful noon, afternoon, evening of the very best intel of the very best intellect can offer to all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yablonka. And now I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Jan Grabowski. I am truly honored for this opportunity. I want to personally thank Professor Grabowski, from whom I learned so much as his student, for kindly agreeing to be the first speaker and for talking about such a relevant subject, Holocaust distortion and the battle for memory and commemoration, the case of Poland. Jan Grabowski is a professor of history at the University of Ottawa. His interests focus on the Holocaust in Poland and more specifically on the relations between Jews and Poles during the war. Professor Grabowski's book, Hunt for the Jews, Betrayal and Murder in German-Occupied Poland, has been awarded the Yad Vashem International Book Prize for 2014. In 2020, Grabowski has been appointed a Distinguished Fellow at the Institute of Contemporary History in Munich, Germany. His most recent book, On Duty, The Role of the Polish Blue Police in the Holocaust, was published in Poland in March of this year, 2020, and we are waiting for it to be published in English within the next year. Professor Grabowski, we are yours. <laughs> Hey, Madeleine, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much. And I am most uh, thankful for this invitation. And I hope you can hear me. Uh, is it uh, is my internet working? Okay. As I mentioned, I am I am broadcasting here from the neck of the woods in, in remote Poland. So I hope it will work out. Now, so once again, thank you for this most uh, kind invitation. And I am touched. Uh, and I always consider myself a friend of Lohama y Hagetaot, and I have been drawing extensively on your resources and hope to draw even more in the future. And I would like to thank very much also the survivors who, as I understand, some of them are today with us. I am very grateful and impressed, and I will try to do my best not to disappoint. Um, I, I will start with, um, um, I don't have much time. As you know, it's going to be a concise, short lecture or talk, uh, 30 minutes with some some leeway on both sides. Uh, so what I would like to start with is a conversation which I had with several of my West European colleagues, historians of the Holocaust, um, from various West European countries who um, in discussions with me said, look, Jan, you are so, you know, not blessed, but um, you should be happy because your work brings so much attention or gathers so much attention uh, and I said, look, I don't think I really enjoy most of this attention. I would easily trade uh, the situation with you for the calm and serenity of your work. So before we start, I would like to show, share with you a few a little uh, scans, which will allow you to, which will introduce the, um, the level of interest, to put it uh, lightly, or the level of passions uh, raised by the study of the Holocaust in Eastern Europe, of course, in this case, in Poland. And so let me now open this, uh, uh, this particular thing. I hope you will be able to see it in a second. Uh, there we go. I hope you see it. Well, this is the title. Uh, and now what you see in front of you is actually a screenshot from the main TV evening news one year ago, one year and a half ago. And under the title, this is a state-run TV in Poland, fully dependent on the currently um, governing nationalists. And so what you see here is a segment called Festival of Anti-Polish Lies. And this actually concerned a, a very, um, very, I would say, academic conference held at one of the most prestigious schools in Paris, Haute um, École d'Études en Sciences Sociales, uh, devoted to the study of the Holocaust in Poland, which met with a fury of the uh, ruling nationalists. And indeed, as you can see here, even the faces of these uh, members of the hostile forces, so to say, were exposed to millions of Polish viewers. So if we talk about the intensity of, not of a debate, there is, it's, we are talking here about a media attack, of course. Um, you can just imagine, uh, you can just imagine what strange forces are at play behind it. Um, another one from last year, as you can see on the cover page of the major uh, pro-government weekly, uh, it's called uh, it's called the uh, court lying. That's how they falsify history. Uh, that is also about uh, your truly and my co-author and co-editor, Professor Engelking. And uh, to bring something more 
a recent aid from two months ago, another pro-government um, publication, Weekly Do Rzeczy, May 25, 2020. Uh, as you can see my, my mug on the, on the cover with the inscription, lie without punishment. Now here we move into so-called incitement to violence territory. If you, have, uh, if you show someone's image, lie without punishment, of course, lies require as you know, uh, punishment. Uh, so now just uh, this, um, uh, this uh, short, let's say, introduction in terms to, um, let's say, to let you know uh, how, um, how important uh, these issues of Holocaust research are in Eastern Europe, with particular, of course, uh, uh, devotion to Poland here. Now, to give you a little bit of a background before we move to the distortion of history of the Holocaust, and if, for those of you who are less versed in the current uh, political scenario, as uh, some of you might know, uh, since uh, late 2015, uh, Polish uh, government has been formed by a right-wing nationalistic party named uh, Prawo i Sprawiedliwość, Law and Justice, um, and since then there was a steady the process of dismantling of fundamentals uh, of Polish democratic system, but also hand in hand, what we were witnessing was the so-called obsession with the defense of so-called good name of the Polish nation as construed by these nationalists. Now, this defense made the discipline of history one of the most internationally visible areas of confrontation in in Poland. Holocaust studies, Holocaust research, and, um, uh, and uh, let me just click on this thing here. Should I, can you see me? Oh, okay. No. Nope. Sorry? Okay, now it's better. It's fine? Okay. Uh, so Holocaust studies, Holocaust uh, research um, and uh, Holocaust education quickly found themselves at the very heart of this struggle over the past. And everything come to, came to a head with the introduction of the so-called infamous Polish Holocaust law of 2018, which stipulated among many other things, prison terms of up to three years in jail for people who dared to suggest, I quote, the Polish nation was in any way complicit in the Holocaust. Now, in order to defend this good name, um, and to shape the historical consciousness of the Polish society, uh, the Polish governments, even before this current one, created a number of institutions uh, which are devoted to uh, controlling the historical memory of the Polish society and to have an impact outside of the country as well. Now, one of them, perhaps, uh, let me once again go to my, uh, go to my slides. And uh, so one of them, uh, is uh, here, as you can see, mm, uh, is the state-funded Institute of National Memory, IPN, uh, another smaller clone called the Pletsky Institute, and I will talk about these organizations uh, in, a, uh, in, a little, uh, in a little while. Now, these, especially the IPN, um, is something of a, a world phenomenon. You have an institution um, which is devoted to uh, the, this reshaping, remaking of historical consciousness, armed with a budget of $110 million this year alone, hundreds of professional historians working, realizing the uh, realizing the goals of the state as formulated by the governing party uh, and also um, armed weaponized uh, in prosecutorial powers with prosecutors on staff. It is a unique institution and its power actually reflects the importance attached to national mythology and memory by the Polish nationalists. Now, what do they do? Well, they have several myths to defend. Generally speaking, their role is to defend so-called the innocence, historical innocence of the nation. Uh, 
Now, they have several mandates. One of them is the alleged universal opposition to communism in the Polish society between 1944, 45 and 89. There is a lot of talk about so-called innocence of the myth of cursed soldiers, cursed soldiers being um, fighters against the communists in the 45, 48 period, glorification of Warsaw Uprising of 1944. Now, you can ask me at this stage, why are you talking to us about things which mean absolutely or nearly nothing to us? Uh, because these things are the myths for internal consumption. However, the one that concerns us, and the only one that has any impact outside the borders of Poland, which has a universal meaning, is the Polish-Jewish relations during World War II, and more specifically, the role of Polish society, of segments of Polish society, in the destruction of Polish Jews. And this becomes the fundamental part and point of the attack on the memory and commemoration of history in the Polish context, in which the Polish state takes no prisoners and no hostages. Now, it's important to understand that for Polish nationalists, uh, the thing is that this particular problem is not a fringe phenomenon. This is a real core of what their ethos is based on. It's not an after-hours pursuit. This theme, national innocence, especially in the context of the Holocaust, is what makes them who they are. It constitutes the core of their beliefs, and more importantly, it constitutes the core of beliefs of their electorate. Now, the most pernicious part of this, uh, of this assault on the history of defense of myths of national innocence is that they are very well received. In other words, propaganda, in order to be successful, has to be somehow desired, cannot be in conflict with what we really believe in. Uh, the communists in Poland, when I was in school, tried for many, many decades to sell their historical narrative. It has been roundly rejected. Why? Because no one wanted to swallow this particular product. However, this what the nationalists uh, through their organization sell today is more than palatable. This is what people want to here. Everyone would like to understand that their forefathers, that their nation, that their tribe were always holding high moral ground. As uh, to quote George Orwell's 1984, I quote, the best books are those that tell you what you already know or what you really want to know. And here we come to the Polish in the Holocaust law of 20. Uh, 18, with, I quote, whoever claims publicly or contrary to the facts that the Polish nation or the Republic of Poland is responsible or co-responsible for Nazi crimes committed by the Third Reich uh, shall be liable to a fine or imprisonment for up to three years. Now, most of you remember the fury which was raised world over. Um, to help uh, people in Poland understand exactly what were the limits of free discourse, the Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs published guidelines of expressions which should not be used in, in official um, uh, speeches. For instance, one of them is Polish, I quote, Polish participation in the Holocaust, end quote. Now, the problem is that the Polish, um, the Polish Holocaust law raised such a fury around concern and fury around the world, which quite visibly was not anticipated by the Polish nationalists, that after six months or five months, the controversial criminalizing provisions of the law had been withdrawn. However, I quote here Pro Polish Prime Minister Morawiecki, who stated in Parliament two years ago exactly, I quote, those who claim that the Polish nation or the Polish state bears responsibility for the crimes of World War II should, of course, be in prison. But we have to act bearing in mind international realities, and that's why we take them into account. And he continued, we strengthened our ability to defend our rights. We are not retreating. This slight correction, the decriminalization, will only strengthen our positions. Uh, so what happens here is that this militant, threatening discourse and tone in matters of history, and most specifically in matters of history of the Holocaust, is now a trademark of the Polish political scene.
Now, in last year, in October 2019, um, Polish um, nationalists going to elections uh, presented their platform and they devoted some space to the issue of uh, academia and scientific pursuits. I quote, the party platform says that uh, academic pursuits are based on merit and ethics, which seems fine, and then they added in justified cases, science can also be shaped by raison d'état. Now, for those of you who don't know French, raison d'état, reason of the state, means the rationale of the state or the higher need of the state to force its own solutions. Now, soon after, Polish Deputy Prime Minister Juan Govin um, declared openly that one of these areas of academic pursuits which should be shaped by raison d'état is a quote, history of the Holocaust, should be, he said, the very field in which the Polish raison d'état would have a special role to play. According to him, Prime Minister, the study of Jewish-Polish relations during the Shoah is the best example of an area where raison d'état should trump independent research. Now, the thing is that, um, that um, here we come to the issue which I really wanted to discuss with you, which is Holocaust distortion. Some of you might have seen a powerful um, seminar given by Professor Yehuda Bauer. Yehuda was talking about the problem of Holocaust distortion, which has become a real problem for scholars and not only scholars of the Holocaust. And I will go in the same direction, although I will offer some specific examples, some visual, let's say, uh, visual props, which will enable you to seize it um, even further. So, a pure Holocaust denial, as most of you know, is, I would say, much of a fringe phenomenon. Disturbing and appalling as it is, it is based. Uh, very few people today would like to uh, would like to deny that European Jews were exterminated by the Nazis and their enablers. And um, unfortunately, much more insidious, dangerous, and popular are the more recent forms of Holocaust denial, such as distortion of the Holocaust. And basically, what it means is uh, that it's it's to say that. We agree that the Holocaust happened, but it was not us, okay? It was the Germans and Germans only. Uh, according to Wiesenthal Center, I quote, it's the exaggeration of the number and the scope and the assistance provided by local righteous Gentiles and attempts to claim that the only local participants in Holocaust crimes were criminals or totally peripheral elements of society. So basically, you have a different kind of Holocaust denial. We call it, in our community of scholars, negationism. Negationism, which says basically that they, the Jews were murdered, but Germans and Germans alone. We had nothing to do with it. In Polish case, it goes this way. We did not do it. It was the Germans. We had nothing to do with it. Our society has been enslaved at the time. We had no agency whatsoever. Our institutions were abolished. The Polish state was no more. If someone hurt the Jews, the line goes, he was no longer the member of Polish Volksgemeinschaft or Polish national community, only criminal margin who excluded themselves by the same token from the aforementioned Volksgemeinschaft of Polish national community. On the flip side, however, the same people engaging in Holocaust distortion say, if one Pole saved the Jews, Poles saved the Jews. So let's look at the problem of that uh, we face today, which is, I call it, how to domesticate the Holocaust. How to make a history of Holocaust palatable um, to people who want to believe in a history of national innocence. And this, of course, flies in the face of modern research and not so modern research. The, the vast majority of sources and the testimonies which we have. Now, the problem in Poland is exacerbated by far um, by the fact that unlike in the Ukraine, unlike in the Baltics, there was never a political project offered by the Germans in Poland in return for anything. In other words, as late as 1944, the Germans had no 
uh, plans of any kind of political solution adopting, co-opting Poles into their European project, unlike in the case of Ukraine and let's say Lithuania or Latvia. So if you, there was no political justification for Petit taking part in the prosecution, robbing and murder of the Jews, other than greed, hate, or simple anti-Semitism or altogether blended uh, together. So what is being done in terms of Holocaust distortion um, in Poland today? One is of course uh, putting the entire blame on the Germans, which is the universal thing, but second is also blaming the victims. How do you blame the victims where you can perhaps remember very famous or infamous uh, words of Polish Prime Minister Morawiecki famously talking about, I quote, Jewish perpetrators and Polish perpetrators, end quote. Um, and the same if I read a recent communique of the uh, IPN, I quote here verbatim, the IPN communique or statement on the crimes committed by the German Reich, I quote, officers of the blue police, these were Poles collaborating with the Germans, similarly to the officers of the ghetto police who eagerly participated in seeking out anyone hiding from occupying forces as well as combating any illegal activity in and outside the ghettos participated in the crimes of the German Reich. Uh, you have here Polish police, you have Jewish police, you have Jewish perpetrators, you have Polish perpetrators, as the Prime Minister said. Uh, and then uh, following on the same manifesto of the IPN, of the Institute of National Remembrance, the, uh, they say, I quote, the Germans made extensive use of secret informers, denunciators and blackmailers who denounced their fellow citizens and fellow brethren. Such groups operated both in the ghettos where the Jews were gathered and outside the ghettos where the majority of citizens were Polish. In any case, in, uh, I would like once again to uh, share with you here one, um, uh, one of these uh, uh, screens, um, uh, which I would like to show you. Uh, let's see how it works, okay. Uh, here what you see is a screen of a Twitter I am posting from last year, uh, made by the official uh, publication of the IPAN. Uh, what you see here, this is the anniversary of the capture and death of Emanuel Ringelblum, the historian of the Warsaw Ghetto. And the story here is the citation from Ringelblum uh, blaming the cruelty of the Jewish police. Uh, one thing that the uh, distortionists uh, responsible for this tweet forgot was that at this time, on March 7, 1944, when uh, Ringelblum was, de was detected in his bunker in Warsaw, the Jewish policemen were long dead, over a year long in Warsaw, they were dead. And uh, Ringelblum was the victim of a special committed unit, detached unit of Polish uh, criminal police, which of course does not fly very well with the current, uh, with the current uh, narrative. So, uh, going back, what to do in this uh, case? So, you blame, you blame the victims a, a bit, you place the guilt on the Germans, and then the most important thing is the righteous offensive. Deflecting of the Holocaust, stressing the universality of the helping hand phenomenon in the Polish society. According to this huge machinery, Pilecki Institute or IPN, Polish Foreign Office, you name them, uh, the current narrative is that the Polish society, by and large, stood by their Jewish um, um, uh, co-citizens and selflessly, with, threat, with the threat to their own health and life, provided Jews assistance wherever possible. IPN has a program, it's called Life for Life. Pilecki Institute has a program called, called by the name, and they are working in the same direction. To give an idea how do you uh, deflect and how do you distort uh, the history of the Holocaust in this particular context, let me send you back to March 24 of last year. March 24 of each year, Poles celebrate and commemorate other Poles. To be more specific, they commemorate and celebrate Poles who rescued Jews under the German occupation. In 2019, so last year, the date was declared an official, I quote, National Day of Commemoration of Poles who helped the Jews under the German occupation. Now, on this national celebrating uh, day of celebration of Polish virtue, and you have to look at the gradual evacuation of Jews from the history of the Holocaust. We call it de-Judaization, a process, is, as you will see, far underway. 
So Prime Minister Mateusz Mazowiecki quoted before paid tribute to a Polish family killed by the Germans for selling Jews bread. Actually. The event took place in the village of Sadowne. Uh, once again, let me share the screen. Um, in the village of Sadowne, uh, here we go. Um, and uh, <coughs> 50 miles northeast of Warsaw, uh, located in a county called Wengrów. And uh, during his visit to the village, Mr. Morawiecki declared that, I quote, the inhabitants of Wengrów County passed with flying colors the exam of compassion. Contrary to various slanders which are being published, the Prime Minister said, probably referring to my own humble efforts to write history, because I was writing about this particular area uh, half a year before. Uh, so contrary to various slanders which are being published, uh, Morawiecki said, numerous sources testify to the great and positive role of the Poles during World War II. And this commemoration of righteous Poles was in this location, was initiated by the Pilecki Institute, one of the many institutions of memory control now created and funded by right-wing nationalists. Now, you might add at this or ask at this stage, uh, 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 you might add at this, ask at this stage, what is wrong with Prime Minister commemorating brave people who gave their lives in order to save dying Jews? Unfortunately, it is not the righteous who are being celebrated. Missing is the context without which is un one is unable to understand why helping Jews was so difficult and so deadly and why so very few people actually engaged in this kind of very risky activity. Now, in order to put this monument in context, Prime Minister Mazowiecki should have probably read a passage from a local survivor, a Jew who was hiding, he was actually not hiding, he was pretending to be a Pole in exactly the same location, in Sadovne. I happened to stumble on this testimony of one Adam Starkov, and he wrote in the, in the, in the, in the Christmas season of 42 to 43, he said, he, I quote, it was not one of peace and goodwill. One cold night, early in January 43, I was already asleep when I was awakened by the rattle of passing rail war, a railroad train followed by bursts of machine gun fire. I need to add that Sadovna is right on the tracks of Warsaw Wachow Małkinia railway, which at the time delivered hundreds of thousands of Warsaw Jews to the extermination site at Treblinka. So we could hear the train grind to a halt. I went to the window. Soon a neighbors came knocking on, on my door and shared the news. Didn't you hear the commotion outside? Some Jews just escaped from a train and the Germans started to shoot at them. They must have hit quite a few. Just think, all these Jews lying on the ground ready for the taking. It's a windfall. We can go out, pick them up and turn them over to the Gestapo. We'll take their clothes clean out their pockets, and on top of that, we'll get a reward from the Germans for bringing them in. Come on, everybody else in the village is going too, so we will better hurry. Otherwise, there will be no Jews for us to, to catch. Minutes later, we could hear moans and screams outside as the wounded Jews were dragged through the snow to barns and stables. To cha the chase well on, went on all night. Now, this particular short, short passage allows you to situate the bravery of the few Poles who really, who really decided to uh, sometimes sacrifice their lives in order, to, uh, in order to help their Jewish neighbors. Presenting this uh, extraordinary courage as a default position of the Polish society is something which is quite outrageous. I don't have much time to go into other details, but, uh, uh, but uh, we shall move on to another, to another slide. Uh, another slide. So we are moving from Sadov. Now, actually, another here is another, uh, another commemoration of the same kind. The important part is that you have a gradual replacement of Jewish victims with noble, uh, with noble um, Gentiles who offered who offered their, their help. Now, uh, moving on, some of you might have heard about um, the, another part of the Righteous Offensive, Markova Museum of Poles Saving Jews, opened four years ago in a remote village of Markova. The museum is open to commemorate, to honor 
Ulma family. And quite justly, courageous people who uh, lost their lives uh, saving uh, two Jewish families. Uh, once again, the visitors to this, you can see on the right side on the wall, sort of a Vietnam Memorial war, wall with names of people who were, um, who were, um, who were, who sacrificed their lives in saving the Jews. So the museum presents a feel-good story, basically, of, um, of, this, uh, of this help. What the museum does not tell you is that the village of Markova, over 1942 to 44 was a scene of absolutely vicious manhunts of local Polish firefighters, of, of local simply civilians, night guards, peasants, hunting down in the local vicinity, in the in the village, in the forest nearby, uh, hunting all the Jews that still managed to survive. This part of the story is not being told at all, and this is once again an example of a gross uh, distortion of the history of the Holocaust. Now, about other kinds of commemoration, I very often like to refer my students, for instance, to a coin which I found in circulation. It's a coin back, dating back to 2008 or seven, so it's not the most recently let's say, invention of the nationalists. It's very much the previous governments. So what you have here is the two zloty coin and the inscription goes Poles saving Jews. And you have here actually a very social realistic hideous depiction of uh, uh, of um, uh, Madame Ulma, uh, the one from the museum with her uh, baby. And if you look here at the bottom, you will find uh, this, uh, I call this coin Our Lady of the Little Jew. You will find this stereotypical little Jew who is not really important for the account. It is, the, of course, the Poles who saved, not the Jews who are being saved or not saved, what is in, who is important. And once again, another coin, just to show you how this commemoration can run wild. You have the Polish eagle breaking through the walls of the ghetto as if official Poland did this particular deed. And once again, another coin, uh, Poles saving uh, Poles saving the Jews. So the offensive is not only in terms of uh, museums, exhibitions, it's also on coins, on every single uh, part of the fight and struggle for the myth of national innocence. Now, some of you have seen probably the vicinity of the Pauline Museum of History of Polish Jews in Warsaw, a very um, a beautiful museum opened a few years back. Now, what you will find in the museum is one thing, what you will find outside the museum is equally telling in terms of struggle of memory of uh, so-called memory patches, I call them. Here you have a so-called co sanitary cordon of Polish memory. You have Jan Karski, the uh, famous courier who wanted to warn the indifferent West about the ongoing, uh, ongoing um, the genocide. So there is a bench in front of the museum. On the other side of the museum, you have the Irena Sendler Alley, a, let's say, of a courageous Polish woman who saved uh, Jewish children. On the, not far away, you have the Garden of Righteous. Um, if, uh, it, everything inside the former Polish, sorry, Warsaw, uh, Warsaw, uh, Warsaw Ghetto. These are these memory patches that have to be assigned on a location where Jewish memories actually exist. Now, here you have another kind of memory patch, which I like to show. This one is from Kielce. It's just next to the house at Plante 7, where the last huge pogrom occurred in July of 1946 with 40 survivors of the Holocaust um, murdered by the mob, Polish mob uh, incited to murderous rage by the tales of, uh, uh, by the tales of uh, blood libel um, or Jews taking uh, Polish children um, to take their blood. So today you have here the memory patch Irena Sendler garden. Another appropriation, as I call it, appropriation of space. Uh, here you are in a territory, I have a few minutes left, I'll try to do my best to be on time. Uh, you have the Clash of concentration camp, a typical lieu de mémoire, a place of memory of, uh, of uh, uh, of the Jewish victims of the Prashov concentration camp one, which you have seen probably in Schindler's list. Uh, so in the background here, you can see the monument and you can see that there is appropriation of space. People live, right? Now, 
here you have appropriation of space and memory, and that's more serious. What you see here in the back, for, in the back is the monument that I discussed, the monument devoted to the Jewish victims of Kwashov concentration camp. Here in the forefront, what you have is the monument devoted to the Polish blue policemen. Polish blue policemen who were shot by the Germans. Now, they were good Polish patriots. Uh, some of them were killed here. Uh, they could have been buried in any other location in Krakow, in front of police headquarters, you name it. Uh, but it's not by accident that they are, they are making this territory a Polish territory. I'm not even going into explaining to you why burying officers of collaborationist blue police is deeply, in this place, is deeply, deeply wrong. I discuss it in my book, forthcoming in English. In any case, this is one more sign. Now, just a few days ago, in the place called Yedwabne, that you know perhaps so much of, and the, the authorities opened a mural, and the mural devoted to Poles and deported to Siberia between 1939 and 41, and uh, to quote, to quote the, the, the chief of the local section of the IPN, uh, one should not, one should not see at Wabner through the prism of a burning barn. So we go away. There is another memory, uh, memory patch uh, for you here. Now, um, uh, I don't have the time to go over all these things, so let me just uh, uh, get out of this uh, scenario. Now, to conclude, now, the current attack on Holocaust history in Poland is a direct result of nation's inability and sometimes unwillingness to come to terms with its own past. The problem, although exacerbated in the last years of the nationalist offensive, has been evident for a long time already. The 2018 Holocaust law has been voted by the nationalists with the support of the opposition. The recent vote which declared Świętokrzyska Brigade uh, allies of the Nazis, good patriots who served their homeland well, was voted unanimously by the, by the Polish parliament opposition together with the government. The issue of the defense of the good name of the Polish nation has become one of the last areas where practically all Poles come together, regardless of their political stripes. The previous democratic governments either unwilling or unable to undertake any serious attempt at civic education which would eradicate the noxious mythology which has today replaced teaching of history in Poland, a mythology of which the history of the Holocaust is one but not the only victim. Usually I would like to finish a seminar, a lecture, a talk with a word of optimism. Here all I can offer is a word of warning and a word of caution. Holocaust denial has been replaced in Poland and in other countries of Eastern Europe with Holocaust distortion. The triumphant feel-good narrative based on half-truths and untruths replaced mature reflection over the most tragic part of the past. Surprisingly, the further we are removed from the event itself, the greater are the pressures to distort the memory of the Shoah. Thank you. I'm muted. Sorry, I was muted. I muted myself. Thank you so much, Professor Grabowski, for an enlightening lecture. Food for thought in these times. Uh, we have a lot of questions, and I don't think we'll have time for all of them, but I want to start with the first question. Um, do you see any parallels between the systemic racism that is endemic to the United States and the domestication of the Holocaust by the nationalist government in Poland? Not really. I mean, the, the, yeah. what makes it what makes it so complicated is that what you see in Poland is not, there is an abundance of anti-Semitism, but it's an anti-Semitism without Jews. Uh, in other words, it is an anti-Semitism which exists in certain cultural stereotypes, in certain behaviors. But mind you, in Poland today, there are, for all statistical purposes, no more Jews left. Uh, in terms of statistical uh, numbers. Mm -hmm. So it is very different from, it is much more, I would say, even insidious, because if you confront a different part of the society, um, you are forced to undertake certain, let's say, mental um, exercises. If you are confronted by it every day here, you have a fairly static image from the past, a construct which continues. So this is what makes it very, very different from what you, uh, what you see in, in places like the United States. 
So now I have another question that takes us to another area. Uh, in what way had the obfuscation of the Holocaust through the creation of an equivalence between Nazi and Soviet crimes became coordinated across borders between state establishments given similar distortions that seem to be appearing in Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Hungary, Eastern Europe. Yes, I mean, this is quite spectacular, actually, that Eastern Europe here came together as one. You can, you can see that the equivalence of, uh, equivalence of Soviet and Nazi crimes uh, is here especially visible in terms of cooperation between Poland and Lithuania on the stage of European Union. Now, I'm not a specialist from this particular part, but it's quite extraordinary how successful, uh, how successful uh, these attempts have been in making European Union and declare uh, this kind of equivalence and of course once you have done this thing then Holocaust becomes also a relative relative issue um, once you once you go down this road Holocaust becomes one of the one of the many crimes and this is actually one of the goals of the uh, of this particular diplomatic effort mm, I'm trying to pick one more question before we uh have to say goodbye to everyone. Well, I can tell you that if you if you if you have you can you can share my email address. I will be more than happy to answer questions afterwards too. Um, that would be wonderful. Actually, I I need to find out how we, how do we uh, keep all the questions and pass them on to uh, Professor Grabowski. We have to see. Um, by the way, there was a question about the baby. Who was the baby uh, and the coin? Oh, the baby on the coin. Well, the baby on the coin is, uh, well, the thing is that the, the Ulma family was uh, a family of seven or eight, uh, and there were children who were killed together with their parents. Ah, so that's, uh, we got an answer for someone who asked, someone who I really uh, admire. Okay, we'll take one more. Um, actually, there was a very interesting question here um, that uh, I don't find the full question. I think here it is, yes. Uh, while not to be used as an excuse to distort the role of Polish citizens during the Holocaust or to feed into the distortionist arguments, couldn't it still be said that the blue police were also victims and that they had no choice? Uh, there would be dire consequences if they did not carry out the orders by the Germans to the roles required of them by the Germans. Very interesting question. Of course, we need to read <laughs> right. I mean, I can. I, I will be very happy to answer this question shortly. Uh, no, there were no consequences. In other words, I present in the book ample evidence that actually refusing an order to shoot, uh, as it was in the case of German policemen, by the way, uh, did not result in. A, I have not found even one case of a refusal, which were which of uh, to shoot Jews, which would uh, result in any kind of penalty, uh, other than mockery from the commanding officers. Furthermore, there were always enough volunteers to replace uh, people who are reluctant to kill. Just as, as, as Chris Browning wrote in about the-, the Ordinary men, immediately I thought of exactly that. the same situation. Yes. So with that, I'd like to say thank you once again to Professor Grabowski. Um, I also want to thank all our participants. You were silent on screen, but many of you asked questions and I'm so grateful for that as well. I put a link onto our chat box. Uh, we have our next lecture in two weeks on the 16th, same time, same day, with uh, amazing Paul Sammons, who will talk about uh, Beyond the Perpetrator's Gaze, close readings of Holocaust photographs, and you are all invited to uh, register uh, and sign up for that lecture as well. And with that, once again, once again, thank you, Professor Grabowski. Thank, thank you, you very much for your invitation, for your patience with me. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me over the email circuit. Wonderful. And I, we will organize our chat and see if we can get our questions answered as well. And thank you again, everybody, for participating. And I hope to see you again in two weeks. Thank Shalom. You,